All right, if you have a Bible, let's open it up to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. All right, 1 Peter chapter 2. And uh, it's going to be, we're going to spend a lot of our time today. Uh, for, for me, is an exciting day. We're going to start today what is a six-week vision series on the vision of Lake Springs Church and what Lake Springs Church is all about. And, uh, and there's going to be a few things that uh, some of you have heard before. Uh, if you're new, you may have never heard any of this before. Uh, but I hope for everybody in the room, there's going to be some really cool um, new things that are introduced in this series as we kind of move uh, throughout. Uh, back in the fall, I kind of set out on this uh, desire that I had uh, to um, craft basically uh, statements of vision for what I wanted our church to look like and be like and what I want our church to be in, in, in moving forward. And, uh, and so there are six statements uh, that, that essentially make up those statements that I kind of have, have written down and outlined and we shared those with the elders and then uh, shared those with the staff. And, uh, and, and have kind of uh, been, been planning to do this series uh, since then because we just want to make sure uh, that, that everybody here knows what it is that we are, are shooting for and what we're striving for and what we want uh, and, and what we feel like God is leading us to and what God is calling us to. And, and here's, the, here's the reality is that um, we, we are a new church, whether you realize that or not. We were a campus of Point Church for three years, and, and now our Lake Springs Church, we've been, almost, we've been Lake Springs almost for a whole year. May 1st will be uh, one year, and so almost a whole year is Lake Springs Church in the books, which is kind of crazy to think about. Uh, but through that process, we were kind of thrust into being an independent church without really having a whole lot of clarity on what that was going to mean and what that was going to look like for the future. And, uh, and so it has taken us some time to kind of figure out some of this stuff. And so we had a vision statement, but no one knows what it is and no one can remember it or say it. So it's like, well, I don't know, uh, maybe we should rethink that. And so, uh, so the first thing we're going to do today is we're going to actually introduce a new vision statement of our church, uh, to you guys. And, uh, and most people, if you were to ask, you would ask, well, most people would say, what's the vision of Lake Springs church? And a lot of people would say to be with Jesus Become like Jesus and do what Jesus did. That's the vision. Uh, but that's actually, that's the mission. That's the mission of the church. And that's the mission statement of our church. And you might be going, well, what's the difference between a mission statement and a vision statement? Well, a mission statement is what you're doing in the here and now to accomplish the vision, a future reality of what is to come. Uh, a mission statement is about what you do. And a vision statement is about who you are. Does that make sense? And so what we're talking about is we're talking about who do we want to be generations from now, decades from now, who do we want to be? What do we want our church to be? And so our vision statement is this, to be a holy people in Holly Springs. Now, I know that sounds incredible, right? I know you're thinking, man, that's the trendiest thing I've ever seen. So edgy, Derek. You're like the edgiest pastor, you and your white shoes. Uh, and I know, I know it's super edgy. No, it, it's, it's not, right? It's just this, it's a very kind of simple thing. Um, but but it, it has a deep purpose and a deep meaning. And I want us to know that this is really what we're hoping for. I want everyone who comes to church to know, like, above all else, what we want to be is we want to be a holy people in Holly Springs. Recently, during our Joshua series, I talked a little bit about what it means to be holy, uh, which just simply is to be set apart for God's purpose. That's what it means to be holy. Set apart for God's purpose. I use this analogy between fine china and regular old silverware. You may remember uh, me talking about this. Basically saying that um, things are set apart a lot of times in scripture. Uh, there, are, there are like holy things that are in the temple. Um, and we think about, we think about uh, holiness as a moral descriptor. Like if you're a good person, you're a holy person. If you're a bad person, you're an unholy person and those kinds of things. But really holiness is not about morality, so to speak, as much as it is about being set apart for a specific purpose. And you guys all have probably experienced fine china, right? You know what fine china is used for. It's used for the, the, the big dinner parties, the special nights, all of that kind 
kind of stuff. It's not the Tuesday night taco, old, just regular old silverware you give to your kids, right? It's the special stuff. And the idea is, is that it's set apart for something specific. It's set apart for something special. And, and so what we want is we want to be set apart for God's purpose, for his will, for his desire, for his design to be done here in Holly Springs as it is in heaven. That's what we want. But in order to do that, some of us are going to have to shift the way that we feel and think in our heads and feel in our hearts. Because the reality is, is that oftentimes in our American individualistic, fast paced, fast food, Burger King, you can have it your way culture. The way we think about the church is we think about the church in the same way. And we think the church and we think God, what they are, are here to do is to cater to us and meet our sensibilities and, 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 and do for us what we want them to do for us. In other words, we think the church... And God are here to bend at our will instead of us being here to bend at his will. Does that make sense? And so this is going to require some shift and some change because honestly, it, it, in, our, in our world, if you don't like the music at a church, you just go somewhere else. Because there's a church that has the music that you like. And if you don't like the children's ministry or it's not doing everything for you that you want it to do, you just go somewhere else because that's just the like there's there's another church down the corner that will It'll meet my needs and do what I want it to do. It'll bend to my will and my desire. Or, you know, maybe you get mad at somebody because if you didn't know this, the church is a people. And so you actually engage with other people. And sometimes those people are annoying. And they, they upset you and they, they hurt your feelings. And it's one of those things that we have to be okay. That like when we get into spats, as we would call them, they might be fights in the real world. But we call them spats because we're the church. When we get into spats, we, we work through that together. We don't just up and leave, right? Like that's the, that's the deal, right? And so, so the idea is, is that, man, but like when we, when we, when we, when we turn the church into something that's there to, to meet our needs or to meet our will or to, to live in our own desires, what we do is we turn it into a catering service where we just get all of our favorites. And we just get to pick and choose. And that's not what the church is meant for. The church is meant to be a holy people, set apart for God's purpose. And we're set apart here in Holly Springs. And so I don't think there's anything wrong with you needing something from the church. Or even consuming something that the church has to offer that's really, really good. Hopefully, there are lots of good things that you take in and really help you and encourage you. But if you never move from the seat of being a consumer, probably you will, not, you, you, you will more than likely fail to become the holy person, the set-apart-for-God's-purpose person that you're ultimately meant to be. And our church will fail to be the set-apart community that we are meant to be. And so I want to just take us to 1 Peter chapter 2 to kind of unpack this a little bit and, and help us kind of get a vision for this and what this looks like. In 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 4, Peter writes this. He says, as you come to him, the living stone. Notice that the word stone is capitalized. That means Jesus is the living stone. So he's talking about Jesus. Rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house and to be a holy priesthood. All right, so, so catch the language that he's using. He says, you're going to be a spiritual house. That's the church. The church is being built around a living stone, which is Christ. We are the living stones being built on Christ. And, and so, so we, the church, become this holy priesthood we are set apart to do what god has called us to do that's what the church is supposed to be we offer sacrifices we worship acceptable to god through jesus christ jesus christ makes it possible for us to worship god without jesus we couldn't come into the presence of god and worship him but because of jesus we can and then peter quotes uh 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 a prophet where he says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. He's saying, you trust in the cornerstone, which is Christ, and you become a part of this holy people. You become a part of this holy priesthood. The spiritual house is being built 
on the foundation of Christ. That all making sense to everybody, okay? So this is just saying how the church is formed. It's formed on Christ and through Christ by us as living stones. Now, let's flip. Hold your finger right there in 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, flip over to Matthew chapter 16, all right? Flip over to Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus is encountering his disciples. He's communicating with his disciples and he actually has an encounter with Peter who we were just reading. He says this. He asks them a question. He says, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for you or for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you lose on earth will be lose in heaven. So he asks this question of his disciples. He says, who do people say I am? They say, well, you're a great prophet. That's what they tell me. That's what they say you are. And he goes, okay, uh, well, who do you say I am? And Peter, as Peter always does, because Peter's the bold one. If you haven't if you haven't read the Bible enough to figure this out, Peter's the one that always says something when he's not supposed to. Right after this in, in Matthew 16, he's going to say something to Jesus, and Jesus is going to be like, get behind me, Satan. Okay? So Peter's the guy that's going to speak up. He speaks up, and he says, you're, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then he says, all right, you are Peter. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Now, you may know this. You you may have heard this. This might be a little bit of a refresher for you. But in the Greek, the name Peter uh, is is the same word as rock. And uh, but but it means little rock. It means pebble. That's what it, it means. Um, And then he uses another term. Jesus says a play on words. He says, you are Peter. So you are pebble. But on this rock, and he says, foundational rock, bedstone rock, cornerstone rock. So he switches the word. And he says, on this, I'm going to build my church. And a lot of people go, well, that means that you're going to build your church on Peter. That's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is, I'm going to build my church on the foundation that I am the son of the living God. The the foundation of the church, the cornerstone of the church, is the declaration that came out of Peter's mouth that you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And on that, I'm going to build my church. And as long as the church is built on that, the gates of hell can't prevail over it. If you you build the church on Jesus Christ, nothing happens can overcome it. Nothing can overtake it. He says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. I'm going to give you the ability to unlock the kingdom and invite people in. Invite them to be a part of this amazing community. That's what we get the privilege to be a part of as the church. And you might say, well, isn't the church in America dying, Derek? Yeah. Don't more churches close their doors every year than the year before? Yeah. And you want to know why? It's because in a lot of in a lot of cases, the church has become a catering service to people's favorites. Instead of a holy people built on the foundation that Jesus Christ is the Son of the Living God. And when that gets pushed against by our culture, when it's just a catering service, it has no ability to stand because it has no foundation at all. Now, you go on and go back to 1 Peter because this is, this is kind of where he takes us. 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, Now to you who believe this stone is precious. So if you have faith, you believe that Jesus, he's, he's precious to you. He's something to hold dear to. You, 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 hold, you hold fast to it. But to those who do not believe, it's the stone the builders rejected. This is also quoting the prophet. And has become the cornerstone. Saying Jesus has become the cornerstone, but the builders have rejected it. The people who are, who are trying to build something of their life, they've rejected that Jesus is the foundation. That the son of the living God is the foundation. He says, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Some uh, translations say that it is a stumbling block of offense. 
So the idea that Jesus is the son of the living God, that he's the Messiah, that he saves us from our sin and makes us into a holy people, that's offensive to most of our world. That's what he's saying. And that is so true. Our world is not just post-Christian. It is anti-Christian. They don't mind churches existing. They don't mind Christians existing as long as the way of Jesus is not seen as the only way. Right? But that's not, that's not holiness. To be set apart for God's purpose is to live in the midst of that place and to be different. And to not waver. To not shift or move just because culture doesn't agree. He says they stumble and they disobey the message. Which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people. You church, you're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. A holy nation. God's special possession. He's taken you as his own. That you have a special purpose. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into marvelous light. That's the purpose of the church. If you're wondering, what does it mean to do the will of God? To do the will of God is by Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ to declare that Jesus Christ is the only one who brings you out of darkness and into wonderful light. That's the message. That's the hope that we have. And that's what we declare in a world that says, well, no, 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 this will bring you out of darkness. Just come on. Try this. No, Jesus brings us out of darkness. But that's offensive. But, but he's, the, he's the one that does it. He's the only way. He's the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. No man can be saved under heaven except through the name of Jesus. He's brought us out of darkness and into marvelous light. Nothing else can. Nothing else will. To be a holy people. That's the vision. To be set apart where Jesus is at the center. He's the cornerstone. The gospel that he is the son of the living God. That he saves us. And offers salvation to all sinners. Uniting us under the banner of one family. So that we can be a spiritual house of living stones. Being built for his purpose. To declare that he's brought us out of darkness. That's the hope. That's what we put our faith in. That's the truth that we stand on. And that we will not waver from. And that we will not fall away from. That we will profess and confess now and forevermore. No matter how offended the world may become by it. Now, here's the reality. If I can say all of that, it's a very different thing to actually live that way. I can declare that. It's a very different thing to in the face of opposing spiritual and cultural forces to stand up and say, no, the way of Jesus is the only way. In the Bible, there is a word that they use to talk about the people who remained faithful and they stayed firm and they trust and they followed God, even when majority culture would not. And that word is called a remnant. To be a holy remnant of faith. To be a, a small segment, a remnant is a small segment of a population. That's really what it, what it means. It means a, a small number. And even if our church grew by thousands upon thousands, we would still be a very small remnant of predominant culture. A predominant spiritual culture, a predominant earthly culture and worldly culture. We'd be a small piece that remains resilient, facing opposing spiritual and cultural forces. You know, there's a story... In 1 Kings chapter 19 about Elijah. Uh, you can go read it. It's a really incredible story. But uh, he's just come off of this unbelievable, like, epic win. Right? If there is ever a win in the scriptures, this is, like, incredible. It's him against everyone. I mean, he's, he's on this mountain, and the prophets of Baal are talking about how great, you know, Baal is. And he's like, all right, well, let's put it to a test. And he challenges him to a competition, and Baal is nowhere to be found. And Elijah makes fun of him, tells him that he's relieving himself in the bathroom. Like, I mean, it's a, it's a whole hilarious story. 
and, uh, and Elijah calls down and calls upon God to bring fire from heaven and God rains down fire from heaven and it is just unbelievable just the amazing way in which God shows up on behalf of Elijah if anybody was that should should be at like the height of ministry right like I mean there have been seasons in ministry where I've been in a really low place and there have been seasons in ministry where I'm really at a high point like you're always at a high point when you're winning right and this is like the time where you would expect Elijah, he'd be like at a high point, and he's like, man, God's on my side. He just proved that he's on my side. Like, I can't lose. And then this girl named Jezebel says she wants to kill him, and Elijah gets all scared and starts running away. It's like, what happened to your faith, man? You know, like, I'm like, come on. Like, you're going to let a, a little girl cause you to turn and run? Like, she must have been fierce, y'all. I mean, like, she must have been something. But so he takes off and he runs to the hills and he's hiding and he's God comes to him and says, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah says, I'm the only one left. No one else. There's no one else. I'm the only one, God. I'm the only one who's trying to be faithful. I'm the only one who's preaching your name. I'm the only one standing on your promises. I'm the only one that's left. You ever feel that way? I do. I'm the only one. And God gives him some instruction, and then at the end of the instruction, he says, but I want you to know something too, Elijah. There's still 7,000 back in Israel who haven't bowed to Baal. There's still a remnant. There's still 7,000 that have not bowed and worshipped him or kissed his feet. You're not alone. You're not the only one. And man, you think about that, and if you know the story of Israel, like when David was king, <laughs> the nation of Israel had um, over a million able-bodied men who could fight in the military. A million. That's just military men. So, I mean, this nation is huge. You think about 7,000 in the, in the scheme of millions of people it's not that much it seems like a pretty small number but it's still 7,000 who are faithful and won't bow down and won't compromise and will stay obedient and faithful no matter what they're going to stand on the promises of God and the hope of God they're going to serve him diligently because they are here to do his will and to be his people set apart for his purpose. That's what we hope for as a church. We hope for as a church when all seems lost. When it seems like the church is losing. And the kingdom of darkness is gaining ground in our world. We're like nope. We're still here. We're still faithful. We're unshakable. We're unmovable. And our prayer is, as long as there is life here on earth, there will be a holy remnant of people right here in Holly Springs. That's our prayer. That's what we want the vision of our church to be. But it starts with us. We're, we're at the very beginning of it. And our hope is, is that as long, like generations from now, there is still a remnant of holy people right here in Holly Springs. That's our hope. But do you want to know the thing that's most tangible, the most tangible thing? That's going to actually allow us to accomplish this vision. To help us become these people. And you're going to say, well, Derek, I know, I know you. You're going to say spiritual disciplines. Right? You're going to say the practices of Jesus. And that'll, that'll help. But it's not, not what I'm going to say. Because all of those things are a means to an end. But... What the most tangible thing, the most tangible thing that will allow us to accomplish this vision of being this holy people set apart for God's purpose here in Holly Springs, the most tangible thing is the presence of God. It's the presence of God. If you go back and you look at the story of the presence of God throughout the scriptures and just its impact and its importance, there's nothing that sets people apart more than the presence of God. You go to the garden. And Adam and Eve are there. And then they make a mistake and they sin. And they fall short. And what's the punishment? What's the result of their sin? 
separation from the presence of God. Then God raises up this family through a guy named Abraham. And they end up as slaves in this place called Egypt. And God says, I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to come and bring you out. And so God brings his presence on on Egypt in, in a way in which causes Pharaoh to actually let them go. And then they go and God provides for them and takes care of them the whole way. His presence is with them. By cloud by day, fire by night, they build a tabernacle for his presence. They have the Ark of the Covenant that goes with them in battle and through battle. And he, the presence of God is with them. And God is on the move and the people are growing. And they, everybody is, is shaking and they're melting with fear because of the presence of God. Because the presence of God is doing it all. And then there comes this time in Israel's history... After David is gone and after Solomon is gone and all the kings and they start to turn and they start to worship other gods. This is the time when Elijah shows up. This is the time when the prophets show up. And they've turned and they've, they've basically said, we don't want to have anything to do with the presence of God. They've quit going to the temple. They've quit worshiping Yahweh. They said, we don't need you anymore, God. We just want what we want. Just let us live how we want to live. Let us do what we want to do. The prophet Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 10, he has this vision. And it's a vision of this presence of God leaving the temple. And God has left the building. And so often we've made the presence of God about a building. And what God has always said and what God has always shown us in the scriptures is that the presence of God has never been about a building. This building is just brick and mortar. It's just wood. It's just a place for the, the saints to gather. It's, there's nothing special about this building. It's about the people. And so in John chapter 1, what we find out Is even though the the presence of God has left the building and no one really wants to have anything to do with the presence of God, God sends his presence to earth. And the the word becomes flesh and dwells among us in Jesus. That word dwells among us means tabernacled with us. (laughs) Like came to be with us. Emmanuel, God with us, lived as a man. Fully, fully human, but also fully divine. And he goes to the cross. And when he dies, he he separates the veil and the curtain that separated God from man and kept us from entering in and kept us from his presence for so long. He ripped it in two and said, access is yours. You have presence of God again. And then he sends the Holy Spirit on the church in Acts chapter 2. And the church has now become the temple of the Holy Spirit and the temple of God. It is about a people. It's never about a building. The presence of God is what makes these people holy. It's what sets them apart for his purpose. And it's what does what only it can do. And so you may be saying, Derek, why are you always telling us to go be with Jesus? I tell you to go be with Jesus because it's the presence of God and the presence of God is what's going to make us a holy people in Holy Springs. Us being with Him and Him being with us and that being our full desire and hope to be with Him and Him be with us, the presence of God will make us a holy people in Holy Spirit above anything else. And so church, I just want to invite you on this journey. We're going to talk over the next six weeks about... These these other statements of vision, but that's the hope is that through these other five things we're going to talk about over the next five weeks We're going to talk about missions. I'm super excited about this We're going to talk about how god is using this church to serve people in like our local community and also in other places of the world It's going to be awesome. I can't wait to share those things that you've never probably heard before I'm super excited to to just share our vision for leadership and what leadership looks like here at our church and who we, we are trying to bring to be a part of this church that we can raise them up and send them out for the kingdom. Like this is, we're, we're going to share all these kinds of things. We want you to keep coming back and come on this journey with us. But we won't, we won't accomplish any of it if we don't have the presence of God. If the Spirit isn't with us. And if God isn't in it. And if it isn't built on Jesus being the center 
cornerstone of it all. So, I want to just encourage you to come walk with us on this journey and be a part of this people set apart for God's purpose here in our community, in our city. For His glory. Not for ours, but for His glory. Let's pray. God, thank You for just the chance we have to be here today and to worship You. You truly are a holy God. And so God, we choose and we We desire above all things to be a holy people because we want to we want to represent you well want to show the world your likeness your set apartness so God set us apart for your glory for your will for your desire we pray this in Jesus name amen I'm going to invite you guys to uh, make your way to the tables around the room. There are a couple in the front and in the back. Uh, it's where we take communion. And we remember that Jesus allowed his body to be broken, his blood to be shed, so that we could even come to him in this time, so we could come into his presence, and we could be with him. So I would encourage you to, to take the cup, take the bread, take the cup, and just spend a moment being with him. Because that's what you're given access to. By his broken body and shed blood. You're given access to him. He became your intercessor. You don't need me to intercess on your behalf. I'm happy to, but you don't need me to. Jesus did that. Jesus did that. You can go be with him right now. So just want to invite you to stand and move and respond. Take communion whenever you feel led.